Dictatorships frequently use art and culture as propaganda to create cults of personality and maintain legitimacy. The totalitarian aesthetic is familiar to many of us from films and documentaries of the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. But for billions of people who still live under authoritarian regimes, these images and experiences continue to be a part of everyday life. Recorded at South by Southwest 2022, this episode explores how dictators co-opt cultural institutions with visual propaganda, using dress, art, film, and architecture to instill fear, impose their vision of society, and reinforce their authoritarian regimes. Welcome to Dissidents and Dictators, a series of conversations by the Human Rights Foundation dedicated to exposing and challenging authoritarianism around the world. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. I think we're going to get started right away. Um, my name is Alexander Sikorsky. I'm a policy officer with the Human Rights Foundation. Uh, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to exposing dictatorships and supporting dissidents and activists where they are most in danger. Um, we've been coming to South by Southwest for, for a while now, since about 2015. In addition to this panel, we actually have a booth in the main exhibition hall. It's booth number 940. And it's about gaming and activism. So if you have some time after this, I recommend you check it out. Um, I'm here with two panelists. We're here to talk about the aesthetics of dictatorship. Um, sitting here in the middle is Louisa Lim. She is a journalist and a professor at the University of Melbourne, where she teaches journalism and writes about Chinese propaganda. Her uh, most recent book is The Republic of Amnesia, which looks at how the Chinese Communist Party has been trying to erase its history, especially pertaining to the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Um, but she has a book coming out next month called Indelible City, Dispossession and Defiance in Hong Kong. And that's about, um, that's about the city of Hong Kong and its, and its protest movement. And here on the right, we have Peter Pomerantsev. He is a senior fellow and a journalist um, at, the, at Johns Hopkins University at the Agora Institute there. Um, and he writes a lot about uh, the Soviet Union and, and Russia, and modern Russia, and disinformation. And his most recent book is called This Is Not Propaganda. And it's about propaganda and, and disinformation. Um, so I'm very happy to have our two panelists here. We were, were supposed to be joined by a third. Uh, she unfortunately uh, came down with an illness that's been going around, um, and she won't be able to make it, but I think we're going to have a wonderful discussion nonetheless. Um, so our topic today is the aesthetics of dictatorship. And the goal of this panel is really to look at how dictatorships portray their power through visual mediums. And so we all have a kind of image of tanks rolling down boulevards, of workers marching in unison, and of posters showing the leader. The, the, the leader. Um, you know, we might be familiar with these images from movies about Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union, but for the many people who continue to live under dictatorships today, those are still part of everyday life. And so our goal here is to really look at what those images, that art, uh, dress, architecture, cinema, um, what that looks like today. Um, but I actually do want to start with a couple of images from the Soviet Union. Um, on the right, we have an early piece of Soviet art from 1920, and on the left, a newer socialist realist depiction of a worker. And so, Peter, um, you know, you're an expert on um, the Soviet Union and, and history there. What can you tell us about how art um, in the Soviet Union developed? How, did, how were artists able to challenge the status quo, challenge censorship, and how did that change over time? Well, artists were um, a lot of modernist and avant-garde, and very daring artists, like that's an El Lissitsky thing, I assume, yeah? The poster on the right um, were very much enthused with the sort of the artistic part of the communist revolution at the start. Um, you know, they were charged with reimagining a new world, creating a new vision of society, and they associated breakthroughs in art and modernism with breakthroughs in social change. Um, it, it can get quite sort of detailed. I went to film school in Moscow and had to read a lot of the theory of sort of the, the Soviet filmmakers in the 20s. And, and, you know, they came up with this very famous, famous form of editing that was very, that nowadays, you know, we see everywhere in, in American cinema or in video clips, like very fast edits. That was a revolutionary sort of innovation that they brought in, these kind of like very fast clashing edits. And, 
they associated that with history moving forward, you know, the idea of progress, that um, you know, they go so far, so far as you'd have two different shots which were opposed to each other, that was meant to be like historical dialectical progress, you know, two types of historical idea moving to create a third. You can take that all with a pinch of salt, but that, that's how they were thinking about the sort of connection between modern art, contemporary art, artistic innovation, and, you know, social revolution. Um, they came up with a lot of more innovations. They, they came up with the idea that because, you know, communism was not about the individual, but about the mass, there wouldn't be heroes in films, you know. Mm -hmm. The hero would be the crowd itself. These are all very, very daring ideas. And, and they lasted around six, seven years, and then they were all shot. Um, because once the communists were really in power, and especially when Stalin comes into power, the last thing he wants is dynamism and change. He wants complete stasis, complete control. And the art changes. It becomes all forms of modernism are become, you know, uh, punishable. Uh, and, and, and seen as sort of like West, you know, not Western, but seen as sort of like bourgeois and, and too innovative and too much about the artist's individualism. And you can't have that. And, and instead you have the art is meant to sort of represent these very kind of, you know, types of heroism that are very familiar from Nazi art as well. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, you know, um, heroic muscular workers and their heroic muscular um, um, brides. Um, but it's all about control. Um, the architecture stops being modernist, it starts becoming neoclassical, these heavy columns that are meant to weigh down on you and crush you. Uh, very interestingly, the architecture in the sort of 30s in Moscow is actually made for tanks and statues. I mean, the, the boulevards are designed for parades. The whole thing is not about the human, it's all about you know, um, you know, these monumental displays of brute force. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the artists have this incredibly tragic fates. I mean, they, all of them, they're all either crushed and made to change, or they commit suicide, or, or they're, you know, exterminated. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very unhappy story about um, this generation of geniuses who, at the end of the day, got into bed with the devil. And um, we all know how that ends up. And so we're going to talk a little bit about architecture later. But Louisa, what does it mean to be a state artist now. You do a lot of work in, on China, and you interviewed a lot of Chinese state artists. And here on the left, we have an, an older style um, piece of Chinese propaganda. On the right, you have a very recent image of Xi Jinping. Um, what does it mean to be a state artist in China today? You know, how, what boundaries are you allowed to push, and what aren't you? Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about those, those pictures first, because I think um, going on from what Peter said the, the image on the left that you can see is very much in that Soviet style, uh, you know, Soviet realism, and that was so popular in China in the 1960s, particularly Cultural Revolution posters were all about the worker, the peasant, the soldier, those sort of three bulwarks of communism. And nowadays you don't see that type of art in China at all, because these, of course, are the three types of people who have not done that well in Xi Jinping's part, uh, Communist Party. So, you know, the symbolism, which was, you know, very similar to that sort of Soviet symbolism, you know, the masses united behind the red flag, it's really interesting that these have kind of completely disappeared from the kind of propaganda that you see today. And that picture that you see on the right is from um, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party, October the 1st, 2019, there was unveiling this new picture of the General Secretary of the Communist Party, President Xi Jinping, and you know, you know, you know, there's no workers, peasants, soldiers, just the red backdrop to really kind of remind people of that revolutionary background, but without saying anything at all, because um, you know, at the moment the party is him. He's as one Sinologist, Jeremy Barmay, calls him the chairman of everything. So there he is, everything. That's all that's needed. Um, being a state artist in, in China today is, is very difficult. There are a lot of lines and they're not clear at all. And that ambivalence is on purpose because then people don't really know what they're able to do and what they're able to not do. So they're always quite, you know, reining themselves in, careful not to cross the lines that are impossible to see. I mean, you know, there are lots of large things that you know you're not allowed to talk about or write about or sing about. But then there's a lot of smaller things as well, and sometimes those lines are just not clear at all. Um, 
one case in particular was uh, the author Yen Yen Ke, who's a very famous Chinese author um, who has done a lot of work which is right along the edges of what is permissible, and he got so tired uh, of being censored. Um, I, I did an interview with him uh, quite a few years ago, and he was telling me how he was so fed up of censorship that he decided to write about his garden. He had bought this new house, it had this beautiful garden, and he said his aim was to write his own version of Thoreau's Walden, but based on his own garden. And he said, you know, it would be, he thought it would be impossible for that to be censored. But even that, when he tried to get it published, there was a line in it where he described a, a, a row of, a column of ants walking across the tree trunk like a column of soldiers, and that line was struck out. So, you know, even descriptions of nature can be censored. That, that's, the censorship is very, um, it's very overt. You know, if you want to publish a book, you're gonna have to have it, uh, um, you know, go through censors if you're in the newspaper, if you paint pictures, you know, you can paint what you like, but if it crosses a line, it, you know, it won't be shown in a gallery, you won't be able to sell it, you know, you won't be able to put it on your website. Um, so, you know, your market is incredibly limited. But there's also, I think, that sort of social um, pressure from other people as well. And that's another thing that I think holds uh, artists back, you know? So if you want to, there is a writer's association and they will actually, you know, you can get a job as a state writer or a state artist where you actually get a salary for producing art. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that art is in the service of the state and um, it's often quite hard to leave if you decide that you don't want to be a state artist anymore. Sometimes you're not allowed to quit. And people find it very difficult because inherent in that act of rebellion, you're also, there's a criticism of people who haven't done that. And sometimes, you know, it's harder to do something which is perceived as rude by your peers. That's almost harder than a sort of major act of rebellion. So there are all these different pressures at different levels on, on state artists. And that really, I think, constrains them and not just state artists, but anyone producing any kind of art in China that wants to make money out of it, you know, they're all subject to the similar pressures. Right, and so given all of these pressures that people, that artists have in dictatorships like China or, or Russia, now I'm gonna show this next slide, do you think that it's possible to create great art that is nevertheless propaganda? This is a still, this is a poster um, for the movie The Battleship Potemkin, um, which it was a propaganda piece by the Soviet Union um, about a rebellion on a, on, a, on, a, on a czarist ship, but it is, by the director Eisenstein, is considered one of the best movies of all time, um, yet it was conceived as a piece of, of Soviet propaganda. So maybe this is a question, we'll start with Peter. You know, can great art, can propaganda be great art? I mean, historically, it always was. I mean, Shakespeare was commissioned stuff by the Elizabethan court to promote her political regime. Um, art and propaganda are very close. You know, when, when, so I work a lot at Hopkins thinking about how do you actually counter disinformation, you know, um, polarization, all these things that we're concerned with. And pretty soon you get to the realization that the only thing that can is, is art in the broader sense, not elite arts, culture. That's really the only thing that can compete with it. And there's a reason that the first thing that the political commissars do when they want to create a propaganda division is either by the artists or force them to work with them. It's very, very close. Both artists and propagandists are trying to work out, you know, that space between your, your you know, people's personality, um, their sense of themselves in the world, and also that connection between emotions, language, and ideology. We're all swimming in that space. The difference is that the artist is trying to set a person free and make them kind of aware of these things, while the propagandist is trying to sort of manipulate them. It's the difference between a, a cult leader and a psychotherapist. Both are working with anxieties, mm -hmm. both of them are working with you know, your vulnerabilities, the cult leader wants to use that and manipulate you, the psychotherapist wants you to bring things into speech and set you free. Now, but it's a very, very incestuous relationship, a very dark relationship, but what usually happens, and I think Eisenstein is an incredible example of that, when the artists end up working for the political commissars, they'll still make art that the political commissars don't like very much. 
I mean, Eisenstein goes on to make Ivan the Terrible parts one and two, which is meant to be a celebration of Stalin and becomes the greatest critique of Stalin. Mayakovsky, the other great poet that worked with sort of the political leadership, ends up writing poems which are somehow subverting Soviet language even while they're promoting it. So that relationship, it's deeply incestuous, very dark, very messed up. But even something like Potemkin, if you look at it, it's full of these sort of criticisms of the whole thing because as an artist, he's constantly making you ask questions. Mm -hmm. So it's a very uneasy relationship and Eisenstein ends up, you know, bloodied, depressed, and, and, and you know, sort of brutalized by the regime at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanna show another slide. Here on the left, maybe a slightly different definition of great art, but on the left is a, is a still from the highest grossing film ever in China, The Battle of Lake Changjin. It, it came out last year and it depicts the Chinese victory over the United States in the, in the Korean War. Um, and it's the highest grossing and the most expensive Chinese film ever made, and yet it is a very, it was produced by the Chinese Communist Party, it's a propaganda piece and it is full of inaccuracies. And on the right we have a still from um, a censored version of the cult film Fight Club, where instead of uh, the, the protagonist winning uh, or, or, or causing anarchy at the end, there's a little saying, which I don't know if you can read it from here, but it says basically that the police found the, the conspirators and put them all in jail. Um, <laughs> and so, so Louisa, you know, in, the, in this kind of, in this world, in the, in the Chinese Communist Party, you know, when, when you have these popular films which are propaganda, when you have censorship of cult films from the West, you know, what is the role that, that the censorship of film and the ability of filmmakers to make a great film, how does that work? Yep, and I should probably say that it is the highest grossing film of all time, but even that is probably not strictly true. Mm -hmm. um, when I was very young, I worked in a Chinese state-run publishing company for a year, and we were always getting trotted off to uh, watch films. Mm -hmm. And you know, the state, the work unit would buy <laughs> tickets for the entire work unit. We'd all have to trot down there and watch a film and everyone would nap through it. So you know, that's the way that they made it the highest grossing film is by forcing all state run employees to, to go and watch it, um, buying tickets en masse. And that's often how propaganda works in China. Um, you know, it, the most kind of recent propaganda is quite populist in many ways. You know, they make these big blockbuster epics. Um, there was also the founding of the party, which was um, starred pretty much every Chinese um, film star who still wants to perform in China. So, you know, it's, it's another way of co-opting all of the artists, even those who were not state artists, you know, pretty much forcing them to be in these historical epics and then forcing all state-run work, you know, work units to go and see them. That, that's how propaganda in China works today. And, and they're also, um, as you said, peddling particular versions of history which are not accurate, in, often in any way whatsoever, even the ones about the founding of the party. Um, but, you know, it's one way of educating your population for the narrative that you want. And I do think the thing that's interesting about this is, historically, there has, um, have been far, far more films about fighting the Japanese than fighting the Americans. This is, I think, the first big propaganda epic where the, the enemy is, is America. So that, that's an interesting development. I mean, when it comes to how to create art in China, I think it's an incredibly difficult thing to do because the line that filmmakers and people making TV have to tread is so particularly thin. Um, you know, Fight Club is such a great example, but you can't actually hardly do any kind of procedurals or detective dramas because the baddies can never win. You know, it, it's kind of boring, but you know, the police are always going to have to win mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a Chinese sort of detective um, drama of any sort. And I did, as my preparation, I did look for a list. I, I started to compile a list of the kinds of things that are banned are in Chinese film and TV. And it actually turned out to be a much longer list than I expected. But over the last few years, the type of content that has been banned includes time travel, ghost stories, palace dramas, shows starring foreign-born stars, shows with celebrities' children, shows with an overt admiration for Western lifestyles, reality TV shows, uh, TV shows about real estate where prices are really high, um, 
shows about uh, cheating and adultery, uh, shows about one night stands, shows featuring uh, murder, smoking, drinking, reincarnation, and most, re most recently this has been a crackdown on uh, shows that feature effeminate men. So, you know, there aren't that many things that you can actually make <laughs> films about. So that's why there's so many uh, war dramas fighting the Japanese, because you're never going to go wrong. You're always right. going to be safe if your enemy is the Japanese. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, as a filmmaker, the last thing you want to do is spend a lot of time and effort and money making a film and then having it banned or having various parts cut out. So, you know, in the last few years, there's this whole weird industry that has grown up around uh, World War II dramas against the Japanese. And, I, you know, I remember when I was based in China, I actually interviewed an extra whose entire, his, his entire job was being a Japanese soldier, and he died in every single <laughs> film. <laughs> you know, that was his, you know, he'd go for auditions and he died. He said he'd probably been killed like 70 or 80 times. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are extras in China who are doing that kind of thing because... It's safe. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the appetite for risk is quite low because, you know, the dangers of crossing those lines are ever-present, and you don't ever really know where the lines are going to be. That, that grey area is part of, you know, keeping people in line is never really knowing, you know, when, you, when you've crossed a line. So, mm -hmm. you know, you could make something one year, um, you know, and it can be fine. Um, so it was like, there was a, a series that was very popular called Chinese Style Divorce that was really popular, but then, you know, next year it couldn't be shown. There was one about um, the real estate ban came because there was a soap opera call about snail houses, like really tiny houses and people with mortgages, mortgage slaves. And, you know, it became so popular that it ended up being banned as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's that real danger of doing something well, too let's, popular. Let's and talk about the banned. most recent thing that, that you mentioned that's been banned, which is feminine men. Yes. And so on the right men. here, we actually have a photo of a very popular Chinese blogger who was banned from the Chinese version of TikTok because there were too many comments where people said he doesn't look masculine enough. So w w what is the role of masculinity in dictatorships? And I know that we're going to talk a bit about Russia later, but you know, in the Chinese example, um, you know, why is the Chinese Communist Party so interested in having its men be masculine? Well, this is quite a recent thing. Um, it hasn't until quite recently been, um, you know, the, I don't think the party has concerned itself that much, but I think this happened in September last year. So this um, blogger is known as Peach Boy, uh, Feng Xiaoyi, and he had 600,000 followers on Douyin, which is a TikTok clone. And he got really famous for this video where he's eating peaches really slowly and sort of talking about how cold they are in this ASMR style. Um, and he got banned for, uh, it was grandstanding and gaudy content was the reason. But it, it's part of this campaign to really uh, inculcate masculinity. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, talk in the state-run media about um, China's masculinity crisis at the moment. Um, and I think part of it is this sort of very muscular nationalism that we're seeing at the moment. Um, but I think there's historically been this real idea of the body as the personalization of the, the state. You know, uh, in um, the early 20th century, there was this very much this view of China as the sick man of Asia because it was so weak, because it was constantly being bullied and humiliated at the end of the 19th century by, by, by Western powers. And so there was a lot of, you know, this conflation of actual sort of physical health and the, the state of the body politic, and they've kind of become intertwined in, in many ways in the Chinese imagination. That. So I think um, this kind of at the moment, this kind of quite muscular nationalism that we're seeing under Xi Jinping um, is really emphasizing uh, this sort of actual sort of muscular <laughs> masculinity being macho. And so they're starting um, masculinity education in kindergarten. I'm not quite sure what that entails. But, um, you know, from, from a Soviet perspective, I think the interesting thing is that one of the most famous 
quotes from Xi Jinping um, was about the dissolution of the Communist Party, the Soviet Union, of the Soviet Union. He has always been very obsessed by this moment. And he said, you know, the reason why the Soviet Communist Party, I actually looked up this quote, because he said it was, a big party was gone just like that. Proportionately, the Soviet Communist Party had more members than we do, but nobody was man enough to stand up and resist. So, you know, I think there's this real requirement almost for manliness now amongst Communist Party members. And, you know, when you're looking at the meetings, you know, all you see is sort of rows and rows of men. The women are sort of, although Chairman Mao famously said women hold up half the sky, they are ever disappearing from the public sphere in China. Well, let's have a look at another man. So, on the left here, you have a very masculine man. Is, is that Jordan Peterson? Uh, not quite. <laughs> this is Vladimir Putin. Um, and, you know, Peter, you've actually written a lot about masculinity and dictatorships, not just about Putin, but other dictators like Duterte, how they portray this masculine image, and also how they use scatological humor and, and make rape jokes as a way of kind of shocking people and showing that the, their manliness almost. And, on the right here, also, a very recent photo of Putin showing off his manhood by placing uh, his interlocutor, Macron, at a very long distance away from him. So, so Peter, you know, why, do, <laughs> why do these dictators, uh, why are they so interested in portraying this image of masculinity, and why, do they, you know, why, are, they, why are they making these jokes that, to, to emphasize that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, if we just focus on Putin for a moment, um, very much like the Xi Jinping, the manliness of the state idea. He comes in, the president before him had a, a serious drinking problem, and Putin was going to be sober, physically fit. Um, there was even a, a sort of semi-ironic, like everything in Russia, but not quite ironic pop song. I want a man like Putin, a man who doesn't drink, like, like a girl, girl, girl band song. And, and that was very much part of his sort of like, his image showing that the state was back. And, you know. mm -hmm. um, the other great introduction that Putin does very, very early in his regime is break with Soviet sort of political language, which is always very stiff and bureaucratic and officious. And he starts making a lot of, you know, jokes that, about private parts and, and rape jokes as well. And it's, it's, you know, what you had with Trump, locker room talk, it's that like, like he's a man of the people. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, you get, they get kind of creepier and creepier and creepier over time. And so just before the invasion of Ukraine, actually literally after this meeting with Macron, he, he talks about Ukraine in terms of a rape joke, about how he was going to rape Ukraine and she'd just have to put up with it. Um, and, and, you know, this sort of talk, it's not just about showing how you're a man of the people. It's got a lot of sadism built into it. Um, and even more so, it's almost like by breaking linguistic rules, you're setting this, the path to break moral rules and break, uh, and break legal rules as well. You know, you're creating this kind of state where anything can be possible. I can say anything, I can do anything, and I can kill anyone. Mm -hmm. um, so something which would be kind of like maybe harmless in another context, when it's strategically used by a Duterte, by a Trump, uh, uh, by a Bolsonaro, it's, it's there to kind of subvert norms more generally. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you talked about the man of the people, and on this next image, here's Xi Jinping wearing a windbreaker. Um, you know, Louisa, is this Xi trying to become, to, to show off his credentials as a man of the people by wearing a sort of working jacket? You know, why is he, in, in what ways is he using dress here to kind of, to, to further his image and, and support his ideology? Absolutely, and notice he's not the only one wearing a windbreaker. This is part of the new uh, fashion trend. Uh, w once he uh, became the um, general secretary of the Communist Party, uh, the new Politburo, all, all seven members, went to the museum together, and this is quite a famous photo where they're all wearing exactly the same windbreaker. Um, so there's real sort of messaging going on through dress here, and the windbreaker is is popular because of those, as you said, man of the people thing, but also it's a signal against sort of hedonism and those, uh, you know, Yves Saint Laurent name jackets, like really smart uh, mm -hmm. Western suits, right? The windbreaker is, is supposed to be showing, you know, that at the very top, this is a leader who's trying to signal he's against corruption, that he's against kind of formalism and bureaucracy. 
um, and that he is a man of the people. And um, another leader, Wen Jiabao, who, uh, who was nicknamed Grandpa Wen in the state run media, he was also, his anorak, his windbreaker, became very famous because apparently he'd been wearing it for 10 years. Wow. So he kept popping up in the same kind of creased, slightly old windbreaker. And everyone was like, oh my God, he really is a man of the people. I mean, you know, this is someone whose wife controls like most of the jewelry industry in China, you know, the gem queen of China, yet his messaging through his jacket was so, you know, that was so efficient and effective. And the, also the fact that perhaps not that many Chinese know about his family fortune. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I, I think it managed through pictures, you know, him turning up at the earthquake scene in Wenchuan in 2008, where there was a massive earthquake in Sichuan, where 90,000 people died and he turned up there and he was sort of climbing to the top of a pile of rubble in his dirty old windbreaker. That kind of um, imagery is incredibly effective still, particularly, um, you know, amongst people who live in the countryside may not be on the internet that much and uh, getting all their information from state-run sources or from WeChat. Right. And so, you know, we actually talked about a little earlier um, how, you know, a lot of these dictators like to put the focus on the masses, on the windbreakers, the working people, um, as a way of kind of connecting with them and showing that they're working for the people even though they're not democratically elected. And so my next image here is a um, photograph of, a, of the a celebration in Moscow of the victory over Nazi Germany. It's the 75th anniversary. Um, and, you know, Peter, you know, Putin loves to put on military parades and military spectacles. And um, why is he trying to link himself so closely with the victory over fascism, um, while at the same time often displaying a lot of, you know, fascist symbolism himself? You know, what is the role of these mass spectacles um, in his dictatorship? I mean, mass spectacles function on, on, on a whole series of levels. Um, even without the military bits, the idea that the you know, mass is more important than the individual is something that was there right from the start. And I'm sure Louise will talk about this. this you know, if you look at the, sort of the way the Chinese Communist Party did its, you know, the launch of, its, of the Olympics, for example, was this huge mass event, mm -hmm. all about saying the individual is less important than, than the collective. So, so there's that in the whole idea of the, the mass. Um, but, but if we're talking about sort of like the exploitation of, of the myth of the Second World War, that's been built up in contemporary Russia very, very strongly. Um, and I mean, to put it very brutally, it's probably the last time Russia had a really big win. So um, you know, <laughs> that's the one you land on. Um, it's one of the few things that can collect the whole nation that everyone agrees was, was a huge sacrifice. There's a religious element to it. We spent so much blood, uh, everybody has a tragic story in their family about the war, and, and achieve something that kind of is universally seen as a good. I mean, everything else before or since is not, doesn't bring people together that way. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and, and, you know, it's even more in Belarus, actually, even stronger in Belarus, in Lukashenko's dictatorship, where it's as if the Second World War is still going on. There are all these signs everywhere celebrating the sacrifice of, like, I think like 40 percent of Belarusians died in the Second World War, as if it happened now. You know, it's almost this religious cycle, it's repeating, repeating, and repeating. And I suppose it it helps in that sense to give people a sense of, of you know of, of catharsis, of emotional highs, sealing identity, um, and so on and so forth. Um, it, but it's it's really kind of a, plays almost a religious role. Mm -hmm. And we will come back to the current war that Russia is fighting against Ukraine with, and the symbolism of that. But I do want to stay on the mass spectacle for a minute. And here is actually an image from the 2008 opening ceremony of the Beijing Olympics. And that's the stadium right next to it. And you know, a lot of people at the time commented on how beautifully choreographed um, that opening ceremony was with thousands of people banging drums in unison and, and how different that was really from the 2012 um, London Olympic ceremony where the individual was really put on a pedestal and various individual rock stars or nurses or, or whoever might be were celebrated. You know, so Louisa, why, why is this focus so heavily on the mass? What does that mean? I mean, I think it's the power of the spectacle. Um, in this case, there were 2008 drummers and 
you know, it was a sort of extraordinary effort. It was, the whole show was a cast and crew of 15,000 people who, uh, you know, for three months, they spent 16 hours a day rehearsing for this moment. And, it, you know, even the, set, the rehearsal for the opening ceremony was 51 hours straight with almost no sleeping or food or anything. So it was almost like one of those, you know, the Cultural Revolution style campaigns, mm -hmm. but transposed into modern mm -hmm. China. Um, and one of the sort of underlying messages, I think that Chinese people watching, uh, you know, they saw it as a moment that really embodied the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. You know, after a hundred years of humiliation by the West, here's the Chinese nation showing, you know, the showcasing Chinese culture, because these are traditional Chinese dramas, and if you remember, there were sections about the discovery of paper and gunpowder and, you know, all the things that China uh, invented. So, you know, it was seen very much as something, you know, Beijing's moment of glory, its re-arrival on, on, on the international stage. And interestingly, when you talk about the state artists, both this and the most recent Beijing um, Olympic, Winter Olympic ceremony, they're both choreographed by Zhang Yimou, the famous filmmaker who has gone on this path from being kind of outside, you know, someone who made quite small art house films, who's now become a state artist who puts on these sort of extraordinary spectacles with, you know, the, the whole state at his disposal. And after this one, he was quoted in the Chinese media as, as saying, you know, how proud of it, that only North Korea could do it better. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, the picture on the right is actually, it was the stadium built for the 2008 Olympics, and one of its designers was Ai Weiwei, who at the time was, was, was already testing the boundaries of acceptable in China, but has since then become an exile and a, and a distant artist. And it shows, you know, how quickly those lines, you know, from you can go from being the designer for the most important building in the entire country at the time to being to being a complete exile. Um, so I'm going to breeze over a little quicker this image because I'm conscious of time and I want to make sure we get to everything. But this is I just wanted to show you guys this image because this is what looks a little bit like Paris. You have the boulevard, you have the 19th century architecture, you have the Eiffel Tower, but then in the background you actually have Chinese apartment blocks. And so this is in fact a village in the middle of China. Um, and it's a copycat of, of Paris, and this exists. There are copycat villages also of, of London and other and of German uh, towns. Um, and this is something that the Chinese Communist Party is actually cracking down on now because um, it no longer wants to emphasize uh, Western architecture and it wants to have more national architecture. Um, and so, you know, Western architecture, as as much as a pastiche as this is, is now also coming under fire um, as part of this kind of Chinese, as, you know, this. Chinese war against Western aesthetics. Um, but I want to go right to this image um, and ask Peter, you know, on the right here we have a, another piece of Soviet art, this time de depicting um, folk costumes uh, of, of people of the Soviet Union. Uh, Peter, what, how did the Soviet Union, how did it approach the idea of folk costume and, and folk culture? Well, I mean, Lenin, who's in the background there, um, had this sort of, and the early Soviet leaders, they had to sort of find a way to deal with the sort of, at times, in places like Ukraine or, or the Baltic states, very, very strong urges for sovereignty and, and becoming proper nation states. Now, obviously, what they did with the more independent-minded leaders of these movements is they, they executed them. Um, if there were classes like the peasants who were hard to control, they, they organized enforced famines and genocides to murder millions and millions of them. But even after that, there was a lot of people who wanted at least the feeling of some sort of sovereignty. And so their strategy was basically to sort of infantilize them and say, oh, look, here's your kind of sense of nationalism. You can have a little folklore costume. Any real contemporary literature was banned. Language was very, very controlled and very small. Language schools, but you could do a little bit of folklore. That was seen as safe. Um, and you could have this sort of infantilized, toothless version of your, of your national project. So it was a way of controlling these passions, um, taming them, and making sure that literally everybody was actually under, under Lenin. And, and um, you know, even the smiles in these pictures are full of this sort of like, you know, very, very fake child, childlike joy. 
And so, Louisa, how similar is that to the way that the Chinese Communist Party treats the Uyghurs today? On the left here, we have an image of Uyghur women. I'm actually going to show you the next one as well, which is another image of, of Uyghur women, but this time in one of the concentration camps in Xinjiang, where they're being re-educated, quote unquote, to, to love China. And you know, how different, how does the Chinese state you know, approach the Uyghur question in this sense? I mean, it's very similar to what Peter has been describing, a move to kind of neutralize Uyghur culture and control it within acceptable limits. And I think uh, one of the precursors to the whole, you know, I mean, now there's maybe up to one million, two million Uyghurs who are in these political indoctrination camps. But, you know, when you're thinking about aesthetics, one of the very interesting precursors to that was a move to uh, reimpose a different aesthetic on Uyghur women. Um, so they started in 2011 this project called Project Beauty, which was a five-year-long project when they redefined what constitutes beauty to Uyghur women. And um, it was very focused on, you know, a, stop getting Uyghurs to stop wearing the hijab or the veil or long dresses, you know, uh, ground-length clothing that might connote Isla Islamism mm -hmm. and, and trying to popularize different types of Uyghur dress that were really kind of made up. They didn't really have a part in Uyghur culture before that. And, and part of that was, part of Project Beauty was uh, having beauticians, setting up beauticians, beauty salons in every village, training these beauticians, even having these let down your hair campaigns to show your beautiful hair. But of course, you know, it wasn't really about hair, it was about getting people to stop wearing the veil. So it was like de-Islamification and changing the ideal of beauty to something uh, which it wasn't. And, and I think, um, you know, all of that happened um, you know, starting in 2011, and, you know, the most, you know, since then, we've seen, you know, the pace of that, you know, it's, it's not a neutralization anymore of Uyghur culture, it's an attempt to obliterate it, you know, we see communities, you know, m many adults being sent to these um, political indoctrination camps, you know, their children are sent to boarding schools, which are, uh, you know, basically training grounds where they're forced to speak in Chinese, so they don't even necessarily remember their native language, they're not able to talk to their grandparents, so family bonds are really uh, dissolved. And um, there's always, especially in these um, indoctrination camps, these attempts to infantilize people and make them perform their ethnicity, you know, this sort of extraordinary... Uh, the dancing, right? Yeah, dancing. emphasis on singing and dancing, and look how happy right. the Uyghurs are. They're singing and dancing. We're preserving their culture because you can tell that here they are singing and dancing uh, traditional songs. And you know, foreign visitors are brought in to see this. And I mean, of course, it's a Potemkin attempt at showing a version of Uyghur culture which is foisted upon Uyghurs by the state. So you're allowed to sing and dance and have a costume as long as it's not too political, but you're not allowed to read your, the texts of your nation or the, or the We're Quran. We're not allowed to read the Quran. Right. Yeah, you know, you can sing and dance, but, you know, the, the words that you're singing and dancing are probably not going to be a traditional mm -hmm. Uyghur song. It's probably going to be a song in Mandarin, which is about the beauty of the motherland or something mm -hmm. like that. And so, yeah. and so, Peter, how similar is this to what the Russians and how they think about Ukraine now? I'm going to skip ahead twice again, and, and we're going to look at you know, the symbol of the Z, which is what the, uh, the Putin regime has been kind of using to promote um, its war against Ukraine. You know, how does the, you know, how does this Z function um, as, a, um, as a symbol of aggression against Ukraine? And how do they, how do the Russians really think about um, Ukraine as a brother nation? Okay, well, I mean, let's pass those two things apart. Why don't we start with the brother nation bit? Um, the way that Putin talks about, um, you know, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus actually being part of one people, one folk, uh, to use sort of the German word, um, is, is, is very much the way the Nazis used the idea of like a real people that was, you know, pure. And then anyone who kind of disagreed with that was not deserving of any rights or life. They weren't real people. So 
Putin's idea is you, you call Belarus, Russia, Ukraine one people, and anyone who disagrees with that, um, who thinks they're not one people and deserve, deserve different states, um, are somehow not deserving of, of the status of normal people and therefore mm -hmm. can be killed. So it's a very, look, it's a very old, cheap uh, rhetorical trick to basically say that those who disagree with my definition of what the people are is deserving of murder. Um, no, it's like the idea know. that some people are not actually people. The no. enemies of the people are not actually people. Exactly. I mean, I, I mean, but it's a very sort of like banal strategy in order to sort of like sort of draw lines about who deserves life and who doesn't deserve life. Um, but the Z is, is interesting. So, so um, there is much about this current Russian campaign that clearly wasn't very well thought through, both on a military level and an information operation level, and largely because Putin seems to have kept it closed to a tiny group of people. So his huge information operation machine was activated very late because nobody was told, you know, they weren't warned. And, and once the operation started, then, you know, and it clearly wasn't going as well as they thought because they thought they'd take, you know, the country in a few days with very little fighting. Um, they needed to gin up some PR campaigns. And, and Russia works, you know, much like America. You have loads of PR companies and the state goes like, oh, we need a PR campaign for our latest policy. In this case, the policy happens to be, an, you know, an aggressive attempt to wipe out another country from the face of the earth, but it's still a policy. And, and, and lots of these PR companies that work in Moscow that were doing Coca-Cola branding yesterday now have to do this. And so they approached it like a branding exercise, like, okay, and all the bright guys sit down and smoke a bunch of weed and, you know, drink a bunch of beer and brainstorm. I mean, they're brainstorming how to brand genocide, but that's still it's the same task. And they came up with this thing of a Z, and they took, basically, it was like, they took the Z that there was some Russian tanks were sort of marking themselves, so was, you know, Russian Air Force would know not to bomb them, basically. And they marked it with a Z. And they're like, okay, well, let's use that, because that's everywhere, and that's already, that, you know, connects you to the army. And, but it's very interesting, because it's a, it's a Western letter, you know. It doesn't exist in Cyrillic. No, it doesn't exist in Cyrillic. So it's this huge campaign against the West. I mean, the idea is the whole world is against us. You're using a Western letter because that works better for branding. And if you want to get to Gen Z, it's a bit Z, Gen Z, Z, genocide, Gen Z, all coming together now. And you can see the PR people like, you know, they're on to bong number three now. And, and, um, and they're like, okay, let's get it out. Let's get it out. Um, let's put it on our sports guys. Let's put it, let's have kids in hospitals lining up to do it. Just like you would for a human rights campaign. You know, it's pretty right. similar. <laughs> um, and then like, okay, well, we need some hero videos. They're called hero videos in, in, in PR campaigns. And they went for one, which is, it starts like this, basically it's this skinhead guy going, we support our guys and anybody who comes out and doesn't support them, as in like anyone who protests the war, we're here, we're gonna show them, we have the force. And then, you, and then they're like, okay, let's find some lines to give these people. Um, and by this time they're onto bomb number five. And they're like, okay, let's just go for it and say one president, one country, you know, one movement, which is, you know, a direct quote from the Nazis. I, right, so I, you don't think it's an, an I, 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 Führer. I think by this time they're like, let's just go for it and just use what the Nazis used. <laughs> kind of laughing, because like, whoa, that's really fucked up. Like, yeah, it is. Um, but kind of going, well, it worked for the Nazis. Um, and look, they've got to deliver this like within like five minutes. I mean, the brief is pretty, pretty tight. Um, they're getting like calls from the Kremlin. Imagine you don't deliver a brief to the Kremlin. It's not like, you know, missing out your deadline for Coca-Cola. Like, the punishment's pretty bad. And so they're like, well, let's, let's just literally do the Nazi sloganeering. Um, and so they create this campaign. They literally have these kids who have no idea what they're doing, clearly, in shopping malls in, re in rural Russia, doing Zeeks, doing, I don't want to do it. I'll get cancelled for, like, fist pumping and going, Russia, Russia, and doing, like, kind of a version of Zeke Heil. I mean, it's, it's completely not bottom-up. It's completely created in a PR, by a PR company. Then everyone's led out to do it. Um, but, but um, and it's just funny, they use a Western, a Western, you know, letter for it. I mean, it's meant to be Gen Z, Zorro, um, but, um, you know, what is it saying as well? I mean, maybe for some people it'll work. I mean, you know, they can, they can promote this very hard on social media, which is very easy to manipulate in Russia and everywhere, but especially in Russia. So they can, they can make it go viral, but there's also a little message there. I mean, for the other people who are very smart in the country, it's like sort of nudge, 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 wink, wink. We all know what we're doing, and maybe we even don't disapprove. It's almost like the guys who made it telling other people, like, like we know this is awful. This is why we've made it almost absurd. But more than that, I think for a lot of people, it's a signal. You know, it's like, oh yes, we're quoting the Nazis. Oh yes, that's where we are now. 
oh yes, don't even think about messing with us. Mm -hmm. So it's not even about kind of like brainwashing necessarily or, or, or persuading, it's sending a signal. This is who we are now. We are openly embracing the darkest echoes of the 20th century to make it very clear that if you step out of line, you know what the consequences are. So propaganda works not just as messaging, but as signaling as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, especially educated people, can decode that. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh my God, this is where the Kremlin's going. I'd better shut up. Mm -hmm. And so one of the other things, in addition to the appearance of symbols, is also things disappearing which used to be there. So you know, in Russia, you can't even hold up a sign that is blank because it is interpreted as a protest against the regime. You know, no, a sign saying no war is one thing, but a blank sign is really a lot of things are disappearing. And I want to turn again back to Louisa and go back to here about you know, the things that have disappeared from Hong Kong. Um, you know, you, we were talking earlier, and you, know, you can no longer buy a yellow umbrella in Hong Kong because it is seen as a symbol of protest. You know, what other things are disappearing from life in China or disappearing from life in Hong Kong um, that are kind of affecting the way that people perceive the world there? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you talk about the blank sign. Words are disappearing. Certain words can no longer be said. And there was a very famous slogan from the 2019 protests, which, you know, millions of people were shouting. It was, um, uh, re um, revive Hong Kong, like, liberate Hong Kong, revolution of our time. That's an eight-character phrase in, in, in Chinese. And that was declared as seditious in certain contexts. So for a while, you had people standing. The day that happened, you had eight people standing on the street in two groups of four, each with a blank sign. Mm -hmm. But they were also told to stop, even though their signs were blank. Um, because the protest movement in 2019 was also uh, using black block techniques, so the protesters were wearing black from head to foot, um, they stopped importing black t-shirts from Hong Kong. It was very, very hard to, for clothing manufacturers to get black t-shirts, even black cardigans. Um, so, you know, certain colors were disappearing, uh, certain words, you know, in universities in Hong Kong, every university had a democracy wall where you could put up posters for anything. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there were these sort of just horribly symbolic moments where the democracy walls were closed down. First they were, you know, they were sort of roped off with danger signs and, and cones, and then they were just made completely inaccessible. Mm -hmm. um, and this is in the University of Hong Kong. It, it is an extremely ugly statue called the Pillar of Shame, but it was um, designed by a Danish sculptor, Jens Galshio, and it commemorates uh, 1989 and um, the, the people who were killed uh, in and an around Tiananmen Square. And um, that was very much a part of the culture of Hong Kong University. Every year, on Ju just um, on June the 3rd, students would go and wash the sculpture in this sort of act uh, of remembrance. And that sculpture itself, it's quite big, you know, maybe four or five meters, you know, two or three stories high. It disappeared in the middle of one night and the area has now been turned into a seating area mm -hmm. with comfy chairs. Um, and so, you know, all of those, you know, not only a civil society organizations disappearing, but also the outward signs, um, you know, the goddess of democracy statues at a couple of universities, they also just disappeared overnight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Many things are being disappeared, pieces of music like Glory to Hong Kong, which is the protest anthem that can no longer be played. Um, you know, words are disappearing, um, books are disappearing off, off library shelves. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's a constant process of subtraction. Mm -hmm. Well, so we have a few minutes left, and I'd like everyone, we're going to have a few minutes for questions. So if you have a question, please line up in front of the microphone here at the front. Um, and hopefully we'll get to you. And while they're lining up, we have actually, oh no, it's disappeared. Oh, here it is. We have a very brief video of a Chinese rap song about the five-year plan. I'm not gonna show you the whole thing because it's actually terrible. But is there, is there some way to play it if I? Yeah, if you put it on. Um, oh, maybe it's too, too technically difficult. But believe me, look it up after the, the presentation. Um, it's one of the most awful things you've heard, but it kind of shows how the Chinese Communist Party is trying to use pop culture as well to promote its 
uh, economic and social policies. Um, but let's go right ahead um, and try and have a few questions. We have about 10 minutes left. Please. Thank you. In 1993, when I first arrived in Moscow, the one thing that struck me right away uh, was the line of married couples, the lady in full uh, bridal regalia, the spouse, they're in a straight line. There's about 10 of them. And they were all walking toward the tomb of the unknown soldier. And it is a practice in Russia, at least not just Russia, in the former Soviet Union, that the married couples go in and provide flowers to the tomb of the unknown soldier because while the Americans lost about 200,000, the Europeans lost about 2 million, the USSR lost between 24 and 26 million, okay? So it is believed that every household in the entire USSR had felt the individual loss of a, of a family member. And it seems, and it's still very strong. I'm sure it is, like you said. And it, it was a big thing since 1993 when I saw it. Last time I was there was 2003, four, and it was still very strong. It doesn't excuse anything that the Putin has done, but the one thing that I find difficult is if we're going to talk about the dictators, we need to also give a balanced look well, at what is driving and allowing them to prosper. I tell people. Well, let's I, let, we have a lot of questions behind you, so I want to let Peter address what you said. So but. why is it that it's, it, I, why is it that you just focused on the visual part, the film part, and why is there no balance in terms of the historical, of why they, they got to be where they are? Peter, do you wanna? Um, so I, the only bit of that question I can address with, it, with, with any substance is uh, the question of commemoration, memory, and loss in Russia. Firstly, to be clear, uh, more Ukrainians died than or as many Ukrainians died as Russians in the, in the fights against Nazi Germany. Um, so we, we, that's very important to keep in mind. Um, so one of the most moving remembrances that uh, appeared spontaneously from civil society activists in, in Russia to make sense of this, this huge loss that quite rightly goes through every family. Um, my grandmother had five brothers, all, all were killed on the front. Um, so it's a trauma that is in every family, um, very, very deeply. Um, and um, they came up with this beautiful thing where you take a photograph of the person, the people that you lost in your family in the Second World War, and you put them on a, on a placard and walk down the streets with them. So kind of really commemorating the death. Completely spontaneous, bottom up, the Kremlin freaked out. It has to own every type of mourning, so you can then manipulate those emotions and transmute them into its campaigns of repression and mass murder. So the first thing they did, obliterated the civil society organizations that did that, and have now made it a state-organized project. Mm -hmm. So any type of real sort of self-organized mourning is, is attacked and co-opted immediately by the state that has to own the trauma, because if you can own the trauma, you can start manipulating it. Right, I mean, the reason that we're focusing on dictatorships is that in democracies, you can actually, you know, there, there is a civil society that's allowed to create independent art that's not censored, whereas in dictatorships like Russia and China, the state controls all expressions of, of art and of aesthetics. And so that's why we wanted to zone in on, on what those kinds of aesthetics are and, and why. Um, I know that Peter has to run to a flight, so, so I'm going to let him go. Um, and I'm really sorry to all the people asking questions, but Louise and I will be staying here and hanging out. So if you want to come chat to us, um, you please do. But anyways, I'd like, can you all please all join me in, in thanking Peter and Louisa uh, for their time. Um,
run through there. Uh, and thank you to South by. And just one more shout out to you know, my company, the Human Rights Foundation. You can follow us on Twitter at HRF. In May, we are doing our own conference called the Oslo Freedom Forum, where we bring together dictators, activists, uh, dissidents, activists, <laughs> to talk about dictators and how to take them down. And that, it's a great event, and I hope you uh, all look it up. Um, but we'll be hanging out here. There's a few other HRF people in the audience if you want to talk to us about uh, dictatorships and dissidents. Um, we're around. But thank you all for coming, and have a wonderful, have a wonderful day. Can I just come up thank you. Oh, oh, no, uh, I, I just wanted to thank you for mentioning Hong Kong and mentioning the, the song and everything. Gong for Hong Kong, see that got me. And uh, sorry, um, I just have a, a question uh, about soft power, um, uh, so the power of culture, uh, because I work in fashion in Paris. And so, haute couture used to be. Uh, really sacred and had to be happening in Paris. Um, but like six months ago, uh, Balenciaga did a couture show in Shanghai. And so um, at the same time, you see that more and more blockbusters are being produced uh, by Tencent and um, Chinese big techs. So uh, my question is, how can we, Western creative and cultural industries, fight that? because um, it seems so huge and at so many levels that it's so hard to fight, but uh, do you have some, I don't know, advices? <laughs> no, it's really difficult, isn't it? I think, um, you know, I mean, collaborations with independent Chinese uh, artists of various types, designers are great, uh, but, you know, I think that there needs to be more focus on, you know, for example, in fashion, looking at sourcing, where, what material are you using, where is it coming from, uh, is there a possibility this is produced by forced labor in Xinjiang, you know, I, um, I know it's a project that HRF has been working on as well. But I think, um, you know, and not just in fashion, in tech as well, you know, these companies that you're doing tech deals with, what are their bus what's their business in China like? Are they involved in selling surveillance cameras that are used in Xinjiang? You know, I just think we all need to be getting a lot smarter about the decisions that we're making on, on a personal level and, you know, seeing whether they're ethical or not. And, then, you know, at the moment it requires more work on our part. Yeah, and I'll be quick, but um, I, I really feel like business is business, and uh, when you have a big fashion company, it's really difficult because they are so attracted by the business in China, yeah. and oh, they're always like, I, I just can't, you know, because it's like um, a huge part of my business is in China, so like I can't do anything. Yeah. Um, but we have seen like 20 years ago the so-called technology transfer that is just uh, spying and stealing uh, IP. And I'm, I'm like, I, I'm so uncomfortable because I feel like no one sees it. So yeah. are we just... But I mean, I think there's work that each of us can do in our own lives, but in, in our own workplaces as well to try and ensure that, you know, we're not enabling these practices. Okay. Thank you, good Thanks. question. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if we're allowed to be in this room. I was going to say for that much longer. Do we need to wrap it up? All right. Okay. I'm sorry. We need to wrap it up, but we will be around, yeah, so you can come talk, talk to us. us. Come talk Thanks to again, us. everyone, for Thank staying. You. Thank you for staying. Uh,